Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when it was the hundred and fifty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the mouse heard the words of the flea, she said, If the case be as thou dost relate and describe, then be it at thine ease here, for naught shall befall thee, save the reign of peace and safety. Nor shall aught betide thee, but what shall joy thee, and shall not annoy thee, nor shall it annoy me. I will lavish on thee my infections without stint, and do thou not regret having lost the merchant's blood, nor lament for thy substance from him, but be content with what substance thou canst attain. For indeed, that is the safer for thee. And I have heard, O flea, that one of the gnomic poets saith these couplets. I have feared content in my solitude, with whatever befell and led life of ease, on a water draught and a bite of bread, coarse salt and a gown of tattered frieze. Allah might, and he pleaseth, give me easiest life, but with what so pleaseth him self I please. Now, when the flea heard these words of the mouse, he rejoined, I hearken to thy charge, and I submit myself to obey thee, and not have I power to gainsay thee till life be fulfilled in this righteous intention. Replied the mouse, Pure intention suffices to its sincere affection. So the tie of love arose and was knitted between them twain, and after this the flea used to visit the merchant's bed by night, and not exceed in his diet, and house him by day in the hole of the mouse. Now it came to pass one night, the merchant brought home great store of dinars, and began to turn them over. When the mouse heard the chink of the coin, she put her head out of her hole, and fell to gazing at it, till the merchant laid it under his pillow, and went to sleep, when she said to the flea, Seest thou not the proffered occasion, and the great good fortune? Hast thou any device to bring us to our desire of yonder dinars? Quoth the flea, Verily, it is not good that one strive for aught, unless he be able to win his will, because if he lack ability thereto, he falleth into that which he should avoid, and he attaineth not his wish by reason of his weakness. Albeit, he use all power of cunning like the sparrow, which picketh up grain and falleth into the net, and is caught by the fowler. Thou hast no strength to take the dinars, and to transport them out of this house, nor have I force sufficient to do this. On the contrary, I could not carry a single ducat of them. So what hast thou to do with them? Quoth the mouse, I have made me for my house these seventy openings, whence I may go out at my desire. And I have set apart a strong and safe place for things of price. And if thou can contrive to get the merchant out of the house, I doubt not a success, and so be that fate aid me. Answered the flea, I will engage to get him out of the house for thee, and going to the merchant's bed, he bit him a fearful bite, such as he had never before felt, then fled to a place of safety where he had no fear of the man. So the merchant awoke and sought for the flea, but finding him not, lay down again on his other side. Then the flea bit him a second time, more painfully than before. So he lost patience, and leaving his bed, went out and lay down on the bench before his door, and slept there, and awoke not till the morning. Meanwhile, the mouse came out and fell to carrying the dinars into her hole, till she left not a single one. And when the day dawned, the merchant began to suspect the folk and fancy all manner of fancies. And continued the fox, Know thou, O wise and experienced crow, with the clear saying eyes, that I tell thee this to the intent that thou mayest reap the recompense of thy kindness to me, even as the mouse reaped the reward of her kindness to the flea. For see how he repaid her and requited her with the goodliest requitals. Said the crow, it lies with the benefactor to show benevolence or not to show it, nor is it incumbent on us to entreat kindly one who seeketh a connection that entaileth separation from kith and kin. If I show thee favor who art my foe by kind, I am the cause of cutting myself off from the world, and thou, O fox, art full of wiles and guiles. Now those whose characteristics are craft and cunning must not be trusted upon oath, 
and whoso is not to be trusted upon oath, in him there is no good faith. The tidings lately reached me of thy treacherous dealing with one of thy comrades, which was a wolf, and how there is to deceive him until thou leadest him into destruction by their perfidy and stratagems, and this thou didst after he was of thine own kind, and thou hast long consorted with him, yet didst thou not spare him. And if thou couldst deal thus with thy fellow, which was of thine own kind, how can I have trust in thy truth? And what would be the dealing with thy foe of other kind than thy birds? Nor can I compare thee and me with the sinker of the birds. How so, asked the fox? Answer the crow. They related this tale of the sinker and the birds. There was once a sinker who was a cruel tyrant. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted say. Now, when it was the hundred and fifty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the crow pursued. They relate that there was once a saker who was a cruel tyrant in the days of his youth, so that the raveners of the air and the scavengers of the earth feared him, none being safe from his mischief, and many were the haps and mishaps of his tyranny and his violence. For this saker was ever in the habit of oppressing and injuring all the other birds. As the years passed over him, he grew feeble, and his force failed him, so that he was often famished. But his cunning waxed stronger with the waning of his strength, and he redoubled in his endeavor, and determined to be present at the general assembly of the birds, that he might eat of their oats and leavings. So in this manner he fed by fraud, instead of feeding by fierceness and force. And thou, O fox, art like this. If they might fail thee, thy slight faileth thee not, and I doubt not that thy seeking my society is a fraud to get thy food. But I am none of those who fall to thee, and put fist into thy fist, for that Allah hath vouchsafed force to my wings, and caution to my mind, and sharp sight to my eyes. And I know that whoso appeth a stronger than he wearieth himself, and haply cometh to ruin. Wherefore, I fear for thee, lest if thou ape as stronger than thyself, there befall thee what befell the sparrow. Asked the fox, what befell the sparrow? Allah upon thee, tell me this tale. And the crow began to relate the story of the sparrow and the eagle. I have heard that a sparrow was once flitting over a sheepfold when he looked at it carefully and beheld he saw a great eagle swoop down upon the newly yeaned lamb and carried it off in his claws and flew away. Thereupon the sparrow clapped his wings and said, I will do even as this one did. And he waxed proud in his own conceit, and he mimicked a greater than he. So he flew down forthwith and lighted on the back of a fat ram with a thick fleece that was becoming matted by his lying and his dung and stale till it was like woolen felt. As soon as the sparrow pounced upon the sheep's back, it flapped its wings to fly away. But his feet became tangled in the wool, and however hard he tried, he could not set himself free. With all this was doing, the shepherd was looking on, having seen what happened, first with the eagle and afterwards with the sparrow. So he came up to the wee birdie in a rage and seized him. Then he plucked out his wing feathers and tying his feet with a twine, carried him to his children and threw them to him. What is this? asked one of them. And he answered, This is he that aped a greater than himself and came to grief. Now thou, O fox, art like this, and I would have thee beware of aping a greater than thou, lest thou perish. This is all I have to say on this. So fare from me in peace. When the fox despaired of the crow's friendship, he turned away groaning for sorrow and gnashing teeth upon teeth in his disappointment. And the crow, hearing the sound of weeping and seeing his grief and profound melancholy, said to him, O oh, fox, what dole and doler make thee gnash thy canines? Answered the fox, I gnash my canines because I find thee a greater rascal than myself. 
And so saying, he made off to his house and ceased not to fare till he reached his home. Quoth the Sultan, O oh, Shahrazad, how excellent are these thy stories, and how delightsome! Hast there more of such edifying tales? Answered she, They tell this legend of a hedgehog and the wood pigeons. A hedgehog once took up his abode by the side of the date palm, whereon roosted a wood pigeon and his wife that had built their nest there and lived a life of ease and enjoyment. So he said to himself, This pigeon pair eateth of the fruit of the date tree, and I have no means of getting at it, but needs must I find some fashion of tricking them. Upon this he dug a hole at the foot of the palm tree and took up his lodging there, he and his wife, Moreover, he built an oratory beside the hole and went out and retreated there and made a show of devotion and edification and renunciation of the world. The male pigeon saw him praying and worshiping and his heart was softened towards him for his excess of devoutness. So he said to him, how many years hast thou been thus? Replied the hedgehog during the last 30 years. What is thy food? that which falleth from the palm tree and what is thy clothing prickles and i profit by their roughness and why hast thou chosen this for a place rather than another i chose it and preferred it to all others that i might guide the erring into the right way and teach the ignorant i had fancied thy case quoth the wood pigeon other than this but now i yearn for that which is with thee quoth the hedgehog I, I fear lest thy deed contracted thy word, and thou be even as the husbandman who, when the seed season came, neglected to sow, saying, Verily, I dread lest the day brings me not my desire, and by making haste to sow, I shall only waste my substance. When harvest time came, and he saw the folk airing their crops, he repented him of what he had lost by his tardiness, and he died of chagrin and vexation. As the wood pigeon. What then shall I do that I may be freed from the bonds of the world and cut myself loose from all the things save the service of my Lord? Answered the hedgehog, Betake thee to preparing for the next world and content thyself with a pittance of provisions. Quoth the pigeon, How can I do this? I that am a bird and unable to go beyond the date tree whereon is my daily bread. And even could I do so, I know of no other place wherein I may wone the hedgehog thou canst shake down of the fruit of the date tree what shall suffice thee and thy wife for a year's probate then do you take up your boat and a nest above the trunk that ye may prayerfully seek to be guided in the right way and then turn thou to what thou hast shaken down and transport it all to thy home and store it up against what time the dates fail and when the fruits are spent and the delay is longsome upon you address thyself to total abstinence exclaimed the pigeon Allah requite thee with good for the righteous intention wherewith thou hast reminded me of the world to come and hast directed me into the right way. Then he and his wife worked hard in knocking down the dates till nothing was left on the palm tree, whilst the hedgehog, finding whereof to eat, rejoiced and filled his den with the fruit, storing it up for his sustenance and saying in his mind, When the pigeon and his wife have need of their provisions, they will seek it of me and covet what I have relying upon my devoutness and abstinence, and from what they have heard of my counsels and admonitions, they will draw near unto me. Then will I make them my prey, and eat them, after which I shall have the plates and all the droppings from the date tree to suffice me. Presently, having shaken down the fruits, the pigeon and his wife descended from the treetop, and finding that the hedgehog had removed all the dates to his place, said to him, O oh, hedgehog, thou pious preacher of good counsel we can find no sign of the dates and know not on what else we shall feed replied the hedgehog probably the winds have carried them away but the turning from the provision to the provider is of the essence of salvation and he who with the mouth corners cleft the mouth without vic victuals hath never left and he gave not over improving the occasion to them on this wise, and making a show of piety, and cozening them up with fine words and faults, till they put faith in him, and accepted him, and entered his den. 
and had no suspicions of his deceit. Thereupon he sprang to the door and gnashed his teeth, and the wood pigeon, seeing his perfidy, manifested, said to him, What hath tonight to do with yesternight? Knowest thou not that there is a helper for the oppressed? Beware of craft and treachery, lest that mishap befall thee which befell the sharpers and plotted against the merchant. What was that? asked the hedgehog. Answered the pigeon. I have heard tell this tale of the merchant and the two sharpers. In a city called Sinda, there was once a very wealthy merchant who had made ready his camel loads and equipped himself with goods and set out for his outfit such a city, proposing to sell it there. Now he was followed by two sharpers, who had made up into bales what merchandise they could get, and giving out to the merchant that they also were merchants, wended with him by the way. So halting at the first halting place, they agreed to play him false and take all that he had. But at the same time, each inwardly plotted foul play to the other, and saying to his mind, If I can cheat my comrade, times will go well with me, and I shall have all these goods to myself. So, after planning this perfidy, one of them took food, and putting therein poison, brought it to this fellow, and the other did the same, and they both ate of the poison mess, and they both died. Now, they had been sitting with the merchant, so when they left him and were long absent from him, he sought for tidings of them, and found the twain lying dead, whereupon he knew that they were sharpers, who had plotted to play him foul, but their foul play had recoiled upon themselves. So the merchant was preserved and took what they had. Then quoth the sultan, O oh, Shaharazad, verily thou hast aroused to me all whereof I was negligent. So continue to edify me with these fables. Quoth she, It hath reached me, O king, that the men tell this tale to the thief and his monkey. A certain man had a monkey, and that man was a thief who had never entered any of the street markets of the city wherein he dwelt, but he made off with great profit. Now it came to pass one day that he saw men offering for sale worn clothes, and he went calling them in the market, but none bid for them, and all to whom he showed them refused to buy of him. Presently the thief who had the monkey saw the man with the ragged clothes set them in a wrapper, and sat down to rest for weariness. So he made the ape sport before him to catch his eye, and whilst he was busy gazing at him, stole the parcel from him. Then he took the ape and made off to a lonely place, where he opened the wrapper and, taking out the old clothes, folded them in a piece of costly stuff. Then he carried to another bazaar and exposed for sale together with what was therein, making it a condition that it should not be opened, and tempting the folk with the lowness of the price he set on it. A certain man saw the wrapper, and its beauty pleased him. So he bought the parcel on these terms, and carried it home, doubting not that he had done well. When his wife saw it, she said, What is this? And he answered, It is costly stuff, which I have bought at a low price, meaning to sell it again, and take the profit. Rejoined she, O oh, dupe, would this stuff be sold under its value, unless it had been stolen? Dost thou not know who is buyeth aught without examining it, faileth into error, and becomes like unto the weaver? Quoth he, And what is the story of the weaver? And quoth she, I have heard this tale of a foolish weaver. There was once a certain village, a weaver, who worked hard, but could not earn his living save by overwork. Now it chanced that one of the Richards of the neighborhood made a marriage feast and invited the folk thereto. The weaver also was present and found the guest who wore rich gear, served with delicate viands, and made much of the housemaster for what he saw of their fine clothes. So he said in his mind, If I change this my craft for another craft easier to compass and better consistent and more highly paid, I shall amass great store of money, and I shall buy splendid attire, so I may rise in rank and be exalted in men's eyes, and become even with these. Presently he beheld one of the mountebanks, 
who was present at the feast, climbing up to the top of a high and towering wall, and throwing himself down to the ground and alighting on his feet. Whereupon the weaver said to himself, Oh, needs must I do this one half done, for surely I shall not fail of it. So he arose and swarmed up the wall, and casting himself down, broke his neck against the ground and died forthright. Now I tell this that thou mayest get thy living by what way thou knowest, and thoroughly understandest, lest peradventure greed enter into thee, and thou lust after what is not of thy condition. Quoth the woman's husband, Not every wise man is saved by his wisdom, nor is every fool lost by his folly. I have seen it happen to a skillful charmer, well versed in the ways of serpents, to be struck by the fangs of a snake and killed, and others prevail over serpents who had no skill in them and no knowledge of their ways. And he went contrary to his wife and persisted in buying stolen goods below their value till he fell upon suspicion and perished therefore, even as perished the sparrow in the tale of the sparrow and the peacock. There was once upon a time a sparrow that used every day to visit a certain king of the birds and ceased not to wait upon him in the mornings and not to leave him till the evening, being the first to go in and the last to go out. One day, a company of birds chanced to assemble on a high mountain and one of them said to the other, Verily, we are waxed many and many are differences between us and there is no help for it, but we have a king to look into our affairs. So shall we all be at one, and our differences will disappear. Thereupon came the sparrow, and counseled them to choose for the king the peacock, that is, the prince he used to visit. So they chose the peacock to their king, and he became their sovereign, bestowed largesse on them, and made the sparrow his secretary and prime minister. Now the sparrow was wont by times to quit his assidious servants in the presence and look into matters in general. So one day he absented himself at the usual time, whereat the peacock was sore troubled. And while things stood thus, he returned, and the peacock said to him, What hast thou delayed thee, and thou the nearest to me of all my servants, and all the dearest of all my dependents? Replied the sparrow, I have seen a thing which is doubtful to me, and whereat I am affrighted. Asked the peacock, What sawest thou? And the sparrow answered, I saw a man set up a net hard by my nest, pegged down its pegs, strew grain in its midst, and withdrew afar off. And I sat watching what he would do when, behold, fate and fortune drave thither a crane and his wife, which fell into the midst of the net, and began to cry out. Whereupon the fowler rose up and took them. This troubled me, and such is the reason of my absence from thee, O king of the age. But never again will I abide in that nest for the fear of the net rejoined the peacock, Depart not for thy dwelling, for against fate and lot for thought will avail thee not. And the sparrow obeyed his bidding and said, I will forthwith arm myself with patience and forbear to depart in the obedience to the king. So he ceased not taking care of himself and carrying food to his sovereign, who would eat what sufficeth him, and after feeding, drinking his water, and dismissed the sparrow. Now one day, as he was looking into matters, Lo and behold, he saw two sparrows fighting on the ground, and said in his mind, How can I, who am the king's wazir, look on and see sparrows fighting in my neighborhood? By Allah, I must make peace between them. So he flew down to reconcile them. But the fowler cast the net over the whole number, and the sparrow happened to be in the very midst. Then the fowler arose and took him and gave him to his comrades, saying, Take care of him. I never saw a fatter or finer one. But the sparrow said to himself, I have fallen into that which I feared, and none but the peacock inspired me with false confidence. It availeth me not to beware of the stroke of fate and fortune, since even he who taketh precaution may never flee from destiny. And how well saith the poet in his poetry, Whatso is not to be shall ne'er become no wise, and that too must come to pass. Yea, it shall come to pass at time ordained, and the ignoramus I shall cry, alas. Whereupon quoth the king, O Shahrazad, recount me another of those tales. And quoth she, 
I will do so during the coming night, if life be granted to me by the king, whom Allah bringeth to honor. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say, and so do I cease my telling of a tale for today till it be morrow.